Pete, uh, join us, please, on stage and, and explain a little bit more about locking and carbon locking. What does it, what does it really mean and why should we be concerned about that? Thanks, Kala. And I, I think I'd like to pick right up on, Goyi, on your theme of, of infrastructure. And is this green growth? Is it brown growth? What determines that? And uh, energy infrastructure, it lasts a long time. Even efficient coal power plants are still coal power plants. As Goyi said, they last 40 years. Road infrastructure enables petrol-based cars to travel for decades. Uh, buildings also last for decades and continue to consume energy. So these decisions take us down pathways that make, us, make it harder to change later. If we choose high carbon infrastructure now, it makes it harder in the future to meet those lower carbon pathways that we've agreed to in, in the international community. Those that two degree pathway. Makes it more costly, harder to reach those, those paths. So I'm gonna start with this picture of this offshore oil rig. It's currently parked in Seattle within view of, of SCI's offices there. That's, that's where I work. It's on its way to the Arctic to, to drill for oil. Now high cost, high risk fossil fuel and energy infrastructure only makes sense in a high, a high carbon pathway. It doesn't make sense in a two, two degree pathway. Now, those that are explore, exploring for, for oil using this kind of infrastructure are counting on that high carbon pathway. They've said as much. This, this uh, rig is being commissioned by Shell and just last week we heard um, from Nick Stern, for example, said, Shell is asking us to bet against the world. If you tweet that, uh, quote Nick Stern, not, not me. Um, <laughs> he's count Shell is counting on the fact that we won't live up to our collective pledges to, to be within a two degree pathway. That's a pretty, that's a pretty big bet. Um, so at SCI in Seattle, in the US Center, we are working on developing an approach, uh, an analytical approach to help policymakers analyze and assess what kinds of energy infrastructure, including both on the demand side and on the supply side, like the, this oil rig, lead to carbon lock-in and take us further away, make it ever harder for us to meet the two degree pathway. So on the demand side, you know, lock-in arises from things that are pretty well known, coal power plants and such. On the supply side, it's harder to point a particular finger at what leads to lock-in. This chart is of future oil uh, supply in 2030. I just picked a year. That's the year that much of the negotiations around Paris uh, are focusing on. Now, if we're gonna have 100, 110 million barrels of oil, the x-axis is annual oil production, then we need all of this oil that is currently being explored. Much of this high cost oil, the y-axis is the cost of procuring oil per barrel. We would need that, it's capital intensive, like it's, it's offshore oil. But what if, we, what if we take the low carbon path? and we only need 70, 80 million barrels of oil a day. That high cost oil infrastructure is bringing us oil and once that capital is sunk, it's bringing us oil that is at a cost that would make it very hard to, to stay within those limits, stay within a two degree pathway. So that raises a question for policymakers. Is there a, does it make sense to pursue policies on fossil fuel supply as well as on fossil fuel demand, the kinds of policies that are more commonly pursued. So I invite you to you all to follow our fossil fuel initiative at SCI, um, fossil fuels and climate change mitigation, which is exploring this question of what role is there for supply side policy uh, Pete, in climate change. Can I just, I'm yeah. seeing both Kazakhstan and Russia here and okay. uh, if there was a uh, figure of natural gas, a lot of additional uh, Central Asian countries, mostly Turkmenistan would be here. And um, 
looking at from the supply side, what, what will happen with those proven deposits of these countries if, if you limit it, if you limit that two degree target, what will happen with those uh, deposits that will, that we knowingly will exceed us above the two degree target? Will they become obsolete? Yeah. Uh, you're asking about s stranded yeah. assets yeah. potentially, which has become a popular concept um, that you know, to, to meet two degrees, we need to leave two thirds of fossil fuels in the ground. Now, it's important to note that we have to, you know, we have so many fossil fuels, even under business as usual, we're gonna leave some in the ground. So it's not, it's not as quite as radical as a departure as you might think. Um, some of the, you know, some high carbon coal deposits in particular, that may lead to, to stranding. Now, oil deposits, as in this chart, are more capital intensive and can still be produced for low cost. So in that case, lock-in may be a greater risk, that once you invest that capital, it's, it, it's harder to strand. It's going to be more likely to be um, produced, and that may be the case for um, some of the natural gas, which is of course more complicated because it also can substitute for coal and therefore reduce emissions in some cases. But, but it, it, if the price stays low as it is today, uh, then a lot of this can't be uh, dug up uh, because the prices will have to go up because the production price is higher. Good point. And in terms of coal infrastructure, that's a, a fascinating trend. As, as Gori said, coal may have peaked in China that's led to some of the investments. You showed three, um, three or four terminals on the Mongolian border f that, that would potentially carry coal. Um, are, are those gonna go forward or not? There are proposals to export coal from the US that have continually been pushed off because of that drop of coal prices. Price. So oh. one might say that's a good development. Yeah. On the other hand, if this other infrastructure uh, along that China builds out along this, this road. Is energy um, intensive then? Yeah, it w then, then that coal demand might very well pick back up again. again. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, Pete. Um,